The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the ninth chapter. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. O us human beings, we are such fickle creatures, aren't we? We live in such a balance between what we should do and what we shouldn't do, and what we do, and what we know we probably shouldn't have done. And we know, as Christians, that we were created good and to do good things, yet at the same time, there's all these temptations around us, and they're so heavy and so tempting. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, um, in, the, in the, the traditional version, we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because it's these things that are so tempting that we know we're not supposed to engage in um, that are the evil. Deliver us from that evil in our lives so that we can go and be free to live instead of be enslaved to sin. Even the way that we view the world, it sometimes leads us to hear and see things in light of what we lose rather than what we gain. I, as I was preparing for the sermon today, I got the idea to look up quotes on um, the things that we take for granted, just to see if there were some interesting words uh, about things that we take for granted. And I'm just telling you all, there were hundreds. The Google machine went crazy and listed hundreds of quotes about what we take for granted, what we, what we don't know we had until we've lost it, or how we should show gratitude for the things that we have already. And, all these really positive things, um, but it made me think that when we have that many quotes, we must really struggle with this, right? Today's gospel sounds so harsh as well. It sounds like something that we're going to lose rather than something that we are going to gain. But I think, really, if we dig a little deeper, it calls us to look forward it's not to forget the other things that have been important, but it is to call us forward into something new. It's not about the surface thing. It very, very rarely is about the surface thing with Jesus. It's always something much deeper underneath. In fact, I don't think Jesus means to ignore your parent that died or ignore your family. But what's happening is Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He has set his face on Jerusalem, meaning he knows it's time for him to start the move back for his death and resurrection to take place. Jesus knows that this is going to bring new life and so sets ahead and invites us to move forward in new life, not our old life. And what he means by that goes all the way back to Genesis. In chapter 3, in ja Genesis chapter three we, 3, we learn about Adam and Eve eating the, the fruit from the tree that they were not supposed to eat, but it was so tempting, and they thought, this is really good, so they do. 
and it propels them into this state of sin, the state of um, sinfulness that we all have um, inherited. That sin is our old life, but what God does is send Jesus to move us forward into a new life so that we don't have to just look forward to heaven someday when everything is good again, but it gives us the opportunity to live a new life now, here, in freedom from sin. And so then we think back to the coins, to the gift of God's grace. That's what this new life is really all about. Grace is about that freedom, the freedom in Christ. This gift, yet it's not cheap, is it? Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about grace and that while we as Lutherans believe that we do nothing to deserve this gift, that we cannot earn it in any way, that this is a gift freely given from God, and that's it. It doesn't mean that when we receive it, we can just do whatever we want because we know God's going to forgive us. That's cheap grace. That is living into grace, forgetting its value and not recognizing the gift that it is because Jesus died. That price was paid for us so that we may be forgiven, so that we may live in this freedom. It is not cheap, so we should not take it for granted. Because we have this gift, we live. Because Christ died and rose again, we live. And so Paul uses Galatians, this verse in Galatians, to help us move forward. Jesus sets his face ahead and sets the people ahead and says, follow me ahead to a new life. And then Paul puts a little bit of flesh on that. I want to go back and revisit the scripture. Freedom in Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit to a yoke of slavery. If we are set free, why would we voluntarily become slaves again? But we tend to do it, right? We're a fickle people, even the Israelites, you know, when they didn't have enough food and water to eat. Oh, Moses, we should just go back to Egypt. Why would you do that? Why would you go back to that, that slavery? And we're called to this freedom. Here's the crazy part. It's not just for us. It's what an amazing gift for us that we each individually get God's grace. When we have communion and we say the for you to each person, that's why when we do communion in non-COVID times, we have everybody come up one at a time, and we'll start that again in August. For you is important that each person knows that it's for you individually. However, through love we become and freedom, we become slaves to each other. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so this grace frees us up to live a life loving others that way. But God also knows that we're not very good at doing that, <laughs> that we mess up, that we uh, sometimes mess up on purpose because we're human. Sometimes we mess up on accident because we're human, because of sinfulness in our lives. And that's when that gift becomes so valuable. Because we don't have to worry when we're doing our best and we still mess up, we can be grateful. Thank God for God's grace that lets us go from all of that. So we're not supposed to just ignore that gift. Paul says, if however you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. Um, and then he makes a list of all these things, these temptations that we get into um, that keep us from loving ourselves and one another, things that are ultimately hurtful, even if they don't seem so right off the bat. And he gives us all of this. But then in contrast, he says, when you live a life of gratitude, when you, when you reach into this new life, when you follow Jesus, the fruit of that is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. When we live
live into our life in Christ, we bear fruit that's not only good for us, but it's good for others as well. I want to take a moment, though, because here's the thing. We're so grateful for this gift of grace because I know there's probably at least one, maybe several on this list that I struggle with, and you probably do too. And there's some that I maybe do a little bit better with, and there's some that you do too. So I'm gonna, I want to read through the list one more time, and I want you to think about the things that, boy, God, thank you for helping me do this well, but wow, God, I really need some work on this. Here's the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. That is my challenge. Kindness generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. If we live by the Spirit, let us be guided by the Spirit. Let us follow Jesus to live by the Spirit because this is what comes when we live following Jesus, when we live by the Spirit. Christ died so that we could live this way and not worry about when we're going to mess up. God, God grants us the gift of grace so that we can live in freedom with each other. And when we live a life of gratitude, when we remember think about what we have gained and not what we've lost, we recognize not only our own gifts, but the gifts of the others in the community and the way that those play together I am regularly thankful on Sunday mornings for the gift of this community and all the things that people share here. The music, the reading, the word, the hospitality, the faithfulness, the prayer. There is so much fruit in this congregation and I hope that we take that out and share it with the world that we enter. These fruits of the Spirit come when we live into our new life in Christ and when we live a life of gratitude. So in a moment, we're going to sing a hymn called, Will You Come and Follow Me? It's also called The Summons. And it's about following Christ, and it's got questions about what that means and what will we give up and what will we know that we gain and will we be thankful for that. But again, if we think about following, not because we have to, not because we do it to earn anything, but simply because we want to, because we're so grateful. Because the gift of grace means we don't have to do anything. If we follow in gratitude, we can recognize and live into this new life. Amen.